Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast with me, Conor Whiteley, psychology student and international best-selling psychology author of over 30 psychology books, bringing you the latest psychology news, fascinating psychology topics and more each week. If you want to learn more, then please check out conorwhiteley.net forward slash books. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube video or follow on your favourite podcast app. And here's the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 226 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Connor Whiteley. And today's episode is on what is person-centred therapy. And it is Saturday the 26th of August 2023 as I record this. So this is an absolutely brilliant podcast episode because this is really interesting to me personally because what I'm actually going to be talking about today is the therapeutic orientation that my therapists use because I'm I'm doing some like short term like therapy work like at the moment so I've had like two sessions so far I've got another two like sessions though and I think it's really interesting. It's a very personal episode, but it really is quite interesting and there are plenty of uh, takeaways for all of us to use, whether we actually want to use this in our personal lives, but also, but also though, if there are any future or current clinical psychologists uh, listening uh, to this, then it's going to be really like useful uh, podcast episode uh, filled with uh, quite a few uh, um, takeaways. So you've got that to look forward to in the content part of today's episode. So moving on to the psychology news section, we've been from the British Psychological Society Research Digest. And the first one is, are people more honest than we think? Does the lack of resources make people more willing to lie to benefit themselves? According to new work led by Law Lishold at the University of Copenhagen, most people, or at least most of the Danish adult participants in the study, believe this to be the case. In fact, this is also what the researchers themselves predicted they would find whilst investigating how resource scarcity affects people's decisions. Contrary to their expectations, however, they found consistent evidence that this was not the case. So I always think that cognitive psychology research is actually quite like um, interesting, especially when it comes to like decision making, because of course like um, economic theory and basically the entire world is basically based on the idea that humans are very very rational people, and then they always consider all of their options, etc., etc. But of course we know in psychology people are not rational. They do not care about all about all the information. Um, they lie and tons of other different like, factors. For example, I like the Fehman effect is still is still one of my favourite cognitive biases of all time. So I do understand why people would think that because if someone has less resources, then they're going to lie more. But it's interesting to see that that's not the case. So it's interesting to see that when we have more resources, we're more willing to lie. But so it makes no sense, but again, the people aren't rational, and this is only more support for it. So I definitely recommend checking that out on the BPS website if you're interested. Oh, wow, I mean, the next one's funny because, like, this week, but I can't go into it. The challenges of creating gender-inclusive birthing services. As society's understanding of gender and sex evolves, our use of language evolves too. Maternity wards and pregnancy care have traditionally largely used um, language centred around uh, women. The word maternity itself for, for one, but also midwife, matron or sister. And while cisgender women remain the primary patients in such services, a rising number of trans and non-binary people who may not identify as women are also engaging with pregnancy planning and birth-related services. 
However, being egg excluded by the language used in birthing settings could lead to these parents feeling othered by the egg aspirants of bringing a child in a, in a, to the world and potentially plant the seed for, for further reaching mental health impacts. A new study by a UK-based research team egg explored the experiences, opinions and educational needs of perinatal staff as related to the needs of trans and non-binary service users. Through their investigations, they found generally welcoming attitudes throughout staff, but a lack of a awareness of trans and non-binary issues, suggesting that a number of, of VSEPs could improve services for these, for these populations. So I'm actually not going to go into the recommendations like them themselves, but personally I do find that quite funny because it's such a weird time in their life that I think that's actually happened like this week. But anyway though, so so this is in a to like deal with and uh, this is in a to actually like, like learn about. It's because I was actually talking about this like, with a friend a like, while back, back though. Even if people do not want to learn about trans stuff, non-binary stuff, and etc., because let's face it, you really can go down the like rabbit hole. Like a few weeks ago, God, like I think it was like a three-week period where every day I was trying to you know, like, boom, I was trying to like learn more like, about it because I find it quite interesting. I also think that it's important to at least be aware about because. Well, well, because I, well, because I, we learn about people with, with like depression and anxiety, so why wouldn't we also learn about the mental health of other clinical populations that we're interested in? But then also, like um, as I was saying, like to my friend, or well, to be honest, like my friend actually like said to me, um, even if you don't want to learn at all, which let's face it, not everyone does. Like I have absolutely no interest and learning about tons of different problems that the, like women like experience like i know about the like menopause i have no interest of actually like um looking into it more but the point is is that because i'm willing to have basic information about it and i'm willing to learn the basics i've been able to have conversations with older members of from my family about it like over the years so really really weird analogy and i realized that over the past week i've become famous for my weird analogies at least inside like my own head so really interesting and it's in importance but i think the overall takeaway to try and bring this back on a track is that there will always be challenges when it comes to like um non-binary stuff and like trans stuff should there be challenges no, and to be honest, if you listen to any May Martin in Nut, because they are they they are an amazing comedian, and I've got my like obsession like with them at the moment. But you'll see that this should be a very non-issue because there are tons of other stuff to actually focus on in the world. So the last one is, how can tech and AI help inform your practice? Okay, this should be a good one. It would be an understatement to say that in interest uh, in using AI, both in research and practice, has grown over recent months. As psychologists, we should be leading this development from an evidence-based ethical perspective. If, like many others, you are looking to get up at today on the use of technology and artificial intelligence in psychological and behavioural interventions, BPS is often a, an online two-hour webinar to get you up at a speed. In it, you will explore how a technology and AI can scale behavioural interventions, identify the role of technology in your practice and context, and consider the ethical consideration of using AI. Suitable for any psychologist looking to learn about the intersection of behavioural interventions and technology, including AI, the webinar will be led by chartered psychologist Dr. Rachel Skews, who was the scientific lead for the innovation at Headspace Health and is an international expert in acceptance and commitment coaching. So the reason why I actually wanted to mention that is, is that because I've spoken about before on the podcast about artificial intelligence, like I know 
I think it's episode 80 of the podcast, so years and years ago now, that there was a podcast episode about AI being helpful to reduce misdiagnosis of anxiety and depression. And I think episode 50 was another AI um, like podcast, and, and then I've also done like, some like, other books like, since then, um, actually about artificial intelligence and psychology. So this problem is not going away. I certainly don't think it will, it should ever replace us because, like for example, I, as I've said so like today, though I'm in therapy, I would never have the connection with a piece of AI. I would never be able to have the conversations I've had with an AI because I simply would not be comfortable with that. So we will always need to augment our practice. But we're like, and that's why I think mobile mental health apps are really interesting but i think at some point we will have to make a um, to make a decision about us personally yeah personally though we can only make that choice we can only make that decision for ourselves if we are informed about it but uh, so we don't need to be experts in ai and yes i am basically harping back to the second um, article we don't have to be experts but we have to know at least the basic amount of information so we can become at least a little bit informed. So I wanted to mention that in case you do want to go to this like, webinar. But uh, I know I won't be because um, I'm not that interested. And I think I've already got a basic awareness. And I know on my list of podcast episodes like to do, I've, I've actually got some AI research there. So I am going to keep learning. I um obviously just this isn't the particular way that I actually want to do it. Oh yeah, and it's on Tuesday the third of Og October, which I'm busy like that day anyway. So it's always in a point though because psychology is changing, and we need to change with it, or we need to help form the change or change that way because otherwise other people that aren't psychologists will make the decision for us which we don't want and that's wrong but it will happen so i hope you enjoy the psychology news section so let's move on to the person update so we're moving on to the person update so there's actually not a lot i can actually say about this week because i do talk quite a lot about it in today's um, podcast episode, so the content part, and I was to talk about it more next week because that one is on emotional dependency. Fascinating topic, which I fell in love with as soon as I found out what it was actually called. So, called that because I know, like last week's a podcast episode, I recommended the program um, Feel Good with me martin because um and at the point that i recorded that i had only watched season one season two even better absolutely amazing program which i learned tons about myself just through that program because you might as well just replace like the main martin character like with like myself so really interesting though and it's just been such a week of self-discovery which therapies helped but I know at the end of the day, I've done the work, I've done the realisations, I've basically put the power back in my own life, which is a really healthy way to look at life. A sort of healthiness that, I, that I've not had like before though. And then another thing that I did not understand about like, this week is that I would end up basically writing a half bit of a like, memoir. Well, because as I'm a writer by a trade, I process a thing not really by talking about it or I don't really internalize stuff by talking about it I internalize stuff by writing about it and I mean I have had some great revelations in like at these like chapters though and I don't know I think yeah like I think it would be a brilliant memoir it's really personal and it's and I think it's definitely gonna be useful for a lot of people like when it's done. So it's interesting though. And it's just an interesting like this like side a project. Because because originally like this week I was gonna try and start like a psychology book, but I just cannot get down into it because my mind is simply not on like psychology stuff. So really interesting self like discovery. 
it's amazing how much you can actually discover about yourself if you let yourself actually want to like to like discover stuff though and i think the entire reason why i'm talking about this is one to be honest two if you need psychological help definitely get it i mean like i know i normally say that but now i truly truly mean it and also i believe it so it's just interesting and it's just like food for thought in the case this is something that you need or maybe i'll say something as an off the cuff a comment and maybe it will kick you into action or maybe you'll like relate to it though but i basically decided that that if I've not discovered something about like myself during the past two weeks, it's probably not worth discovering. <laughs> and basically that just sums up how busy the past two weeks have been. So hopefully next week it will be a very slow, very boring, very non-eventful week. But I sort of know I won't let that happen because I will definitely give it myself I something fun to do though. Because I'm starting some university sort of like next week anyway. So as always, I always love to hear your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So you can always email me, conorwiley at conorwiley.net. You can always leave a comment on the show notes at conorwiley.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi wiley. I always love to hear from all of you because it really helps make the podcast feel more like a, a conversation. And today's episode has been sponsored by Abnormal Psychology, the causes and treatments for depression, anxiety and more. So even though this particular um, psychology book doesn't actually focus on any therapeutic approaches, it still focuses on some, on a wide range of really interesting mental health conditions. Uh, conditions. For example, biological, social and the cognitive causes of the oppression and also what like maintains so, like, the oppression. It also talks about schizophrenia, all the different types of anxiety and there's so much more really interesting in, like, uh, in information in the terms of what causes mental health difficulties. But then it also talks about the uh, treatments for example psychological, social but also the um, cultural and the biological treatments for the oppression and uh, impression that was all of that goes into really interesting depth and if you want to understand mental health for con- conditions at, at a deep level then definitely like check it out i really do recommend it so that's abnormal psychology the causes and treatments of depression anxiety and more available from all major ebook retailers and you can get the payback and the hardback version from Amazon, local books to all local library if you request it. And you can buy the ebook directly from me at payhip.com forward slash con Wiley. So for boss buying books helps to support the creation and the editing of the podcast. My time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. And as always, a massive thank you to my patrons because your support shows that you like the show and that you want it to continue. So if you wanted to become a, a patron of the show and get tons of great rewards, uh, including early access to the blog post, then you can now become a, a patron at patreon.com forward slash the psychology world podcast. So let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So we move on to the content part of today's episode. So we're going to be talking about what is person-centered therapy. And as I mentioned in the introduction to the podcast episode, so the reason why I'm talking about this specific um, therapeutic orientation is simply because this is the one that my therapists use. Even though, to be honest, I shouldn't really call them my therapist simply because they're actually a counsellor. And um, even I don't really know the difference exactly um i know there is a difference but but to be honest for, for the sake of clarity and to be honest i'm not sure i really care enough <laughs> about the difference is it simply like let's just use them interchangeably so let's dive into it what is person-centered psychotherapy person-centered therapy is a client-based psychotherapy it uses a non-authoritative approach to mental health difficulties 
It allows clients to take the lead in therapy sessions so that they can discover their own solutions to their difficulties. This particular approach to mental health was started by Carl Rogers because he believed that every person is unique, which, let's face it, we are, and everyone's view of, the, of their world should be trusted. In other words, he believed we should never ever doubt our clients and how they describe the world, because to them, that is actually how the world works. Personally, I do understand this because everyone interprets different situations and events differently depending on their past experiences. And to be honest, this is what the cognitive behavioural approach is saying, um, just with like different words because the cognitive approach believes it isn't the events themselves that cause mental health difficulties, it is our beliefs and, and it is our interpretations of them that leads to difficulties. Furthermore, Carl Rogers firmly believed in self actualization This is the idea that all of us have the solutions, knowledge and power to make the changes we need in our lives. As well as this, a therapy is non-directive, so the therapist doesn't take the lead and instead follows the client and doesn't engage in any direct conversation. However, something I'm seriously starting to notice is that all of these different approaches to mental health are basically just rehashing what the others already said. For example, every single psychotherapy I can think of is about self actualization and making the client realise they can make uh, the changes needed in their lives using the tools and guidance the therapist gives them. Yet, only they can make the change for themselves. This actually isn't unique to any approach, it really isn't. Furthermore, I would admit that the non-directive part of person-centred therapy does require a bit of getting used to. Since I love the cognitive behavioural therapy, you guys all know that I've done more than enough podcast episodes on it. Because this is very structured. So I did have to let go of the idea that she was going to lead because I had to lead instead. Like, thankfully though, I mean, I'm not putting like myself down, but thankfully I've got so many mental health difficulties and I've got so many bad coping mechanisms that are tied up in like different parts of my abuse and trauma. And to be honest, I have more than enough to talk about, but it still requires a bit of like relearning. Anyway, during a person-centred therapy, a therapist isn't the lead as we know. Instead, the therapist is known as a compassionate facilitator because they listen to the client without judgement. They acknowledge the client's experiences without changing or moving the conversation and they are there to support the client without interrupting them or in impacting on their own process of self-discovery. In my experience, that acknowledgement and validation, I say in air quotes, in a fashion is extremely important, and it does feel great to have someone else call your um, abuse and trauma, well, abuse and trauma, and I will happily admit that the process of the self-discovery it is scary how much you can actually discover about yourself when you actually free yourself up to. Like, I really cannot say um, everything that I've discovered about myself on the podcast because I would literally have to do like 20 podcast episodes just on that alone because there's so much. But it is a lot of fun. I It is annoying as hell at times. Like, I'm so infuriated by one thing that I've discovered about myself, uh, which makes literally, right, which literally no one else would actually find annoying, but it's more the timing that I'm in a few rated by. Yes, yeah, so like, just a little bit of like mystery um, for you. And honestly, as much as we really don't want to discover anything more about myself, I know I won't. That is okay, to be honest. Oh, I think there's a storm outside. Overall, the reason why the therapist doesn't interrupt this process of self-discovery 
and lead is because it's down to the client to uncover what hurts them and what they need to do to repair it. And this is a very powerful realization when it hits you. Wow, well, I've just had to check outside. There's a terrible storm. My, I hope it doesn't um, affect the mic quality at all. How does person-centered therapy work? The entire point of person-centered therapy is to step away from the more traditional psychotherapeutic models, where the therapist is the leader and expert, and instead the client is the expert in it themselves. Again, this is something that I've mentioned a thousand times before on the podcast and in books. Therefore, person-centered therapy has three central tenets that allow the therapy to be successful. Firstly, the therapist has an unconditional positive regard, so they are empathetic and non-judgmental due to the therapist accepts what the client is saying as true and they want to convey to the client that they are understood, confident, trusted, and they are valued. As well as the client is free to make their own better choices and decisions in their life. This tenet I think is very powerful and helpful because I have tried to talk about my past before and there are only ever three outcomes really. And I do not blame anyone for these three outcomes. So firstly, they call me a liar because they simply don't want to hear what I've got to say because of what I have to say is simply too painful. Okay, I get that one. Secondly, they are sorry for what's happened, but ultimately they can never understand it at a deep level. And to be honest, that's sort of the more average one I get from friends. Like, they know what's happened to me. They say they're sorry, but equally you can see that they can't understand it, which... I get, I really, really get. Thirdly, they actually understand it, but the problem is that it is a a common trauma and abuse, so they aren't comfortable listening to it. And because of emotional dependency and other difficulties, I end up burning them out, which is another reason for the podcast episode next week, which is on emotional dependency and locus of evaluations. Secondly, there is congruence or genuousness, as the therapists have no air of authority um, to them. Instead, they present themselves as accessible and their true self that clients can see is honest and transparent. And this is definitely true. I might be autistic, so reading and understanding people is always going to be hard. By God, is it hard at times. But I understand that my therapist is honest and transparent. Finally, there is empathetic understanding, where the therapist wholeheartedly accepts and understands the client's views as well as feelings in a way that can be helpful in reshaping the client's sense of their experience. Normally, I think this final part is done by accident, again, I say in air quotes, in a fashion, because just by listening and talking and offering up good psychological insights, my therapist has helped me to realise a lot about myself and how I do myself and my past and my relationships. On the whole, in this therapy, whenever the therapy is a working well, the clients feel they are better understood in these sessions and that this leads them to feel better un- understood in other areas of their life too. This does have research support, especially whenever a client identifies the unconditional positive regard in their therapist, there is an increased chance in positive outcomes, since the therapeutic relationship between the therapist and the client is a type of therapy in itself. When is person-centered therapy used? A person-centered therapeutic approach might be used with groups and individuals, be it adults or or adolescents, in a short or long-term fashion. The people that tend to take this approach and benefit are people that want more confidence, a stronger sense of identity and authenticity, increased trust in their own relationships, and more successful in establishing and maintaining, and that's the bit that I've added, their interpersonal relationships. In addition, 
Like other approaches to mental health, the person-centered approach doesn't have to be used alone because it can be combined with other therapies to treat depression, grief and, and anxiety. Although it can also be used to treat trauma, abuse, family stressors and so much more. And because this is a client-led psychotherapy, it is the more motivated and determined clients that do better and are more successful at this therapy. Personally, even though I did not choose person-centered therapy, I am so glad I ended up with it since I've only had two sessions like so far and I have found it so useful in understanding my own relationships my identity, self-confidence, and it's basically taught me just to let go of what other people think of me. Like, I didn't actually realise how much I cared what other people think to do with a certain aspect of my life. But now I'm just like, I really don't care. care. Like, if other people want to have an opinion, that's fine. But it no longer defines me. I mean, so I do talk about this a bit more like next week, but person-centered therapy has been immensely useful to me. What to expect in person-centered therapy? Even though I've mentioned my own egg experience throughout the podcast episode, the only other thing that I want to say is that the therapist might repeat your words. And this is not them trying to be annoying or anything. It is simply them trying to understand like what happens, what do you mean and how you feel. It could also be them trying to draw out a little more in, in information too. Of course, they might have misunderstood you. And I think that's happened once or twice so with like myself. One time was when because I was laughing as a coping mechanism, um, when I seriously like screwed up like something she couldn't quite un understand why I was laughing about something that was extremely serious to be honest it was not that serious but to me it was because it was so important to me but anyway though moreover there might be moments of of a silence in the therapy and this I can be good because it allows us to process our thoughts and realizations since person-centered therapy is all about self-acceptance and self-discovery. Or um, if you're like me and you have so many things to unpack, you basically don't stop talking for the in a high session. Then you end up uh, at the end of the therapy uh, feeling a little overwhelmed because of everything that you've learned, discussed, and it does take a little while um, after therapy, I think for you to actually realise what you've learned. So, learned that, like, I know the technique that I use is, um, besides from writing a like, memoir, <laughs> mm. is also like just to try and find two major lessons and simply take that away from the therapy session and sort of let everything sort of not drift away because you've heard it, heard it though, but maybe not necessarily focus on it quite as much. I hope that made some, some sense. Conclusion. Overall, person-centered therapy is all about allowing a client to talk, explore their difficulties and find the solutions for themselves. This is extremely helpful in my own egg experience, but again, I have recently learned that I have very high emotional intelligence, which is funny because I used to be extremely bad at it. A person-centered therapist should always have the ability to be calm in their sessions and they will need to let a, a client verbalize their frustrations and disappointments too, since this can all help a, a client to gain insight into what's hurting them, and most importantly, how they can move forwards. Personally, I'm willing to say that person-centered therapy has already changed my life for the better, and since I've still got two more sessions, I'm actually quite excited to see what else will happen. What will I learn? And most importantly, how else can I change my life for the better? Therapy can be seriously fun, interesting and life-changing, if you want it to be. So I really hope that you enjoyed this podcast episode. I know that I did because I, because I have not been in a good place for quite a few 
to be honest, if I'm being really honest, I've not been in a good place in years. It was just there was sort of like a crisis point early in August where I sort of like needed when I basically went right. If I want to, if I want to be okay, I it's sort of like I've got to do something now or I'm never actually going to do it. So it's been really interesting. And this week, I finally sort of settled in myself and thinking, right, I feel good again. And that's because of therapy. And I also know how I need to change my life for the better. The way how I need to rethink about certain things. I need to sort of like um, develop uh, not so much a new identity, but I sort of need to accept every single part of myself more. And sure, part of that's like therapy. All of it's my own work and like what I've been focusing on with the amazing suggestions of my like therapist and also like May Martin's help like tons though. So as you can tell, we've got a mind obsession at the moment. But it's interesting, it's useful, they make me laugh tons of, and tons of so life's good. So I won't say that therapy is easy, by God is it not. But it's really, really like good though. So Quite, um, quite a personal episode, but I liked it and I really hope that you did too. If you know someone who enjoyed today's episode, then please share it with, uh, with them. Um, I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help spread the word about the uh, podcast. And if you wanted to learn more, then definitely check out uh, Abnormal Psychology, the causes and treatments of depression, anxiety and more. Available at all the usual places. And you can buy the ebook directly from me at payhip.com or with slash con whitely. And if you're willing to become a, a patron of the show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash the psychology world podcast. So have a great day, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. Please have remember to like the video and subscribe to the, the YouTube channel and follow the podcast on at your favourite podcast app. And if you wanted to learn more, then please check out the backlist of the podcast episodes or my books at conwhitely.net. So have a great day and I'll see you next time.